Good morning to you. Glad to, well, sort of see everybody this morning. Um, welcome to our live service on Facebook this morning. Pastor Brian is not here with us this morning, and so you're stuck with me. Please stay. Don't run away. Um, and welcome to my home. This is our kitchen. Um, and I just want to tell you that we're not really in my home. We're in the studio. And, and so we're in front of a green screen. I don't want to make it seem like uh, we're trying to trick you. But I did want to welcome you into our home this morning. And so this is a real picture of our kitchen uh, yesterday morning after we cleaned it, after breakfast. And um, our dining room, some pictures. So welcome uh, the first church and many churches around the world do meet in each other's homes still and I uh, just wanted to welcome you to our home. This morning our message is going to be about this world is not my home and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 and um, so if you want to get your Bible out or your device and go ahead and turn to Hebrews 11 we're going to go through that together and also Gareth is with us. He's going to uh, put up the scripture for us and help me with the video thing. So um, say hello, Gareth. He's on my right hand over here. All right, thank you for helping. And um, <clears throat> so before we begin, I got a couple of announcements, not very many right now. Uh, cookbooks, we still have plenty of cookbooks. If you're interested in purchasing one, they're $15. You just let us know, me or Pastor Brian or... Um, you can text us, you can send us a message here on this uh, live stream or message to church, just any way you can get in touch with us. We will reserve a cookbook for you. And if you haven't picked up any, your cookbook, you're already, they're still here and they're safe in the church. You can contact us about picking up your cookbook. Um, also, our church, service, church services, a lot of people are asking when we're going to meet again in person, and the deacons are still discussing that, so we're going to meet again closer to the end of the month to see how the situation is and pray about it and see when God wants us to get back together. Um, also, <clears throat> we have some prayer requests to go through. Robbie Davis and his family, Evelyn and Erica, continue to pray for them. Pray for Paul Vaughn and Miss Janet. Paul's been struggling with some health issues and, and um we continue to pray for them. We pray for Marie Pryor. She had a procedure. She had the procedure, right? Yeah, and so we pray for her recovery. Uh, pray for Marvin Peterson. He has a blood clot in his leg. We're going to continue to pray for Donna and EO as they continue recovering. Donna had a pretty intensive knee surgery, and EO has had pneumonia for several weeks, but I understand they're both improving. Thank the Lord. Pray for Kathy Morgan. She had uh, knee surgery uh, not too long ago, and she's also recovering. We're going to pray for Peggy Messer, Greg, Brenda, and their family. We pray for them. Um, this, the Lord seems to be maybe calling Miss Peggy home soon, so we're going to pray for them and, and uh, over the next days and, and weeks. And we pray for Hugh Green also. He has either has or had procedure. I don't know the timing on that yet. Pray for Joyce Hyatt. She's uh, expecting a baby, I think, in February um, or March. Hayden Stepp is also expecting a baby. We pray for the, them. We're going to pray for Miss Tracy Hill. Uh, she's had some different health issues, and she needs our prayers. Um, Pray for Dale Gilbert. He has prostate cancer. We're going to continue to pray for Diana Dietrich. That's Paul Vaughn's daughter. She's in Texas. She has ALS. We're going to pray for Joyce Price. And that's Melissa Stepp's mom. She has cancer. And Patricia Price, Karen Bradley's mom, she also has cancer. And I know everyone has many prayer requests of your own, unspoken. I have many unspoken. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're so very thankful for you. We're thankful for your wonderful word. We're thankful for our church family and the ability to meet here this way. Um, 
virtually in my kitchen together. Um, we're thankful for your message this morning. Um, we pray that you have your way with me. Let me be emptied of myself and my opinions and my preferences and anything you don't want me to say to represent you wrongly. And I pray that you just fill me with you and your words as we go through your wonderful word this morning. That the things you want to be said and heard be heard and, and your church be moved. And we pray for the many folks on our prayer request. We know that you have uh, amazing plans for everyone um, and the situations they're in. And, and each one, I pray that you bring them closer to you, the families, the people involved in these the, uh, the different procedures and sicknesses or uh, upcoming childbirths. All these things, Lord, you use for your glory to bring people closer to you. And we thank you, Lord, that my family knows you, that we're all saved and we're all yours. And we're thankful as we go through this message that this world is not my home. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're going to start off reading Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. Forgive me if my voice is a little shaky and you can hear my heartbeat. That will go away shortly. Um, so let's put our scripture up on the screen, Gareth. And we're going to start in verse 13. And this is where we're going to frame our message for, the, for this morning. And we're going to go back and, and, and look through it in more detail in just a few minutes. So verse 13. These all died in faith. Right there, thank you. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if... They had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. They might have had an opportunity to return, to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Amen to that for sure. So I want to talk a little bit about how this world is not our home today. Um, before COVID hit, before this past year, I used to go on a lot of business trips and often I would go overseas. I would go to Germany, I've been to England, I've been to different countries. Uh, our headquarters for the company I work for is in Germany. And often I would go and I knew while I was there that I had work to do while I was there, but I was not home. You know, this world, Germany or wherever it was, was not my home. My home is here in, in North Carolina. My home is with my family here, you know, in this, in this kitchen, in this, this place. And uh, while I was there, I had an assigned task to do. I had work to do, and it kept me busy, and it kept my mind occupied, and it made time go by faster. But it would have been a failed trip if I had gone and not taken care of the things I was supposed to while I was there. And, it, and But no matter how busy I was or how occupied my time was, I always longed to call back home to, uh, and to be home. I couldn't wait for that flight and those trains to get me there to finally come home and see my family again. And um, every day what kept me grounded and stabilized while I was there and motivated to do a good job also was the thoughts of home. And my home my calls to home, which was awesome. I could do video calls at my home, and that encouraged me that they're still there waiting for me when my work was done to come home. There's no place quite like home. Even if you're on vacation, you're at the beach, or whatever it is, there's a point, and it's time to go home. And so while I was away, my home, I had homesickness, and I want us 
as Christians to think about and focus on what our, where our real home is and, and what are the results? What's, what's, the, what are, what's going to happen as we're focusing on that reality of where our home is? And I, <clears throat> I think about this song from Warren Barfield. It's called Take My Life. Warren Barfield is a singer-songwriter. He lives in Nashville right now, but he was a pastor's son who grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He had a hit song on the movie Fireproof with Kirk Cameron. If you've seen that, this Love is Not a Fight was his hit song. But this song... I'm going to share some of the lyrics with you, Garrett's going to put them up for you. And um, it starts off saying, This world is not my home. This life will pass. Only what is done for God will last. With the time we have, let's not waste it away. Let every heart beat, every time our heart beats, let every breath we breathe say, Lord, take my life, use it up. And the next verse says, Lord, without you, nothing makes sense. Down here, the grass dies on both sides of the fence. How true that is. All my vain searching will never amount to much. Here's my life, Lord. Use it up for the cause of love, for your cause. Take my life. And use it up. And I always enjoyed the lyrics of that song. It reminds me of this scripture in Hebrews 11 we, we read just a moment ago. And, and I want to talk about one of the best ways to find out what's being, what's said here in the scripture is to, to figure out the context that it's in. Often we read a Christ scripture and we take it out of context because we're putting our thoughts on top of it in our situation. But to figure out what it really means, we need to go through the context of what it means in the Bible. So we have, I'm reading out of King James, and uh, this is Stephanie's grandfather's. I'm honored to use this. He was a very special man in her life, and she was given this Bible, and I have permission to use it, to preach out of it. I'm thankful for that. Sweet tater. We, uh, <clears throat> so in Hebrews 11, the book of Hebrews is written basically in my simple-mindedness for it's kind of like a, a dissertation or a fancy essay or it's really a letter written to the Hebrews or we would think of them as the Israelites. Remember that in, when they were in Egypt and God called them out of Egypt, they were called Hebrews, which means they're not from here. That's what Hebrews means. Around here we would say, you know, y'all ain't from around here. And that's what Hebrew means, someone who's not from here. So it fits what we're, you know, this world is not my home. And so also this letter was written, uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it. A lot of scholars believe it was the Apostle Paul, but we can't confirm because all of his other letters said, I, the Apostle Paul, at the beginning or the end. This one does not name anyone. So we don't know who wrote it, but it is in Scripture. It's part of the Bible. And Hebrews was written primarily to discuss to the Jews, um, maybe they had been converted over to Christianity, maybe this was a tool to use to bring them over into Christ, but for them to understand how the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus. So it's a really deep and awesome book, one of my favorite books, and this is one of my favorite chapters and one of my favorite passages, because I like the idea of thinking of um, this world not being my home. Uh, so we're going to start at verse 1 and just go through these really quick. We're going to focus in verse 1 and 2 a little bit, and then we're going to skim through a little faster and look at the context of these verses. So verse 1, ready for it, Gareth? Verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. So this chapter 11 is called the faith chapter. All right? It's called the faith chapter. You put that back up there for a minute because we're going to talk about this. Faith chapter, and it's also a lot of people call it the hall of faith or the roll call of faith because we're going to read in a moment that there's several Old Testament, the, the, New, the King James calls them elders, but it meaning like that they are 
um, elders is, is in like the older folks, the, the, the past generations. And so now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is a definition of faith from the Bible. The substance is like a, a firm trust. You know, a substance. We're made out of a substance. All of us are made out of a substance. And so, it's the faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, we use this word hope wrong, or we have it has evolved, if you will. When we use the word hope, it's like, I, I hope sweet taters going to make spaghetti for supper this week kind of thing. You know, and that means that I wish she does, which means there's a chance it won't happen. But I wish it will. I hope it does. But that's not what it means in Scripture. Hope is a certainty, a thing that is absolutely going to happen. Like all the promises of God that are in this book, okay, hoped for. It is faith is the substance, the firm trust, the assurance, the foundation, if you will, of the things hoped for. Jesus is going to come back. This world is not our home, okay? And those are the things we hope for. And this verse continues, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the evidence of things we can't see. I can't see Jesus. I can't see the Holy Spirit, but I know he lives in me. I've never seen God, but I've given him my whole life like many of you have. Uh, also, I haven't seen this city that's coming, my new home that's coming. I've never seen it. But my faith is the evidence of things not seen. Okay? All right? This is the definition of faith from the Bible. Verse 2 says, For by it, elders, it is faith, for by faith, the elders, that's the people from the past that we're going to talk about, obtained a good report. That means, there's another word, uh, some other translations say were commended. But I like this, they obtained a good report. By faith, they got a good report from God. Okay? By their faith. Not by the things they did. Of course, the things they did was a witness of their faith. But you can't just work your way into heaven. It is by faith, right? By faith, I am saved through grace. It is not by my works, but it's a gift from God. By faith, I have been saved, not by what I've done. What I do is evidence of my faith after the fact. So faith, for by faith, the elders obtained a good report, which is good. We don't want a bad report with God. We want a good report. Verse 3 says, through faith, now through faith, okay, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And this word framed here doesn't mean like a picture. When I first read framed, I think, okay, we framed it up to display it. No, it's like you framed up a house. Okay, I build the frame of a house. That house has to sit on a foundation too, and the foundation has to be good. But other translations of the Bible and the Greek word here that's used, because this was originally written in Greek and not English, um, this framed, it could be translated into created, okay? The worlds were created by the word of God. Through faith, we understand that God created everything. It didn't come from a big bang and billions and billions of years. It came when God spoke it into existence. Our world was, there was nothing, and then all of a sudden, everything in six days, okay? And we see that. So that things, the rest of this verse says, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Which, which do appear, I have to look at that and dissect it a little bit because it's not written in a modern English, but it's basically saying the things that we see now that were created were made from things we, couldn't, we can't see. There was nothing that existed prior to God speaking everything into existence. Through faith, we understand this. Now it begins to do this roll call of faith. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Okay? Abel understood God's prophecy of that God is going to send a Savior. 
it was said in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, that God was going to send the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And that was the first time Jesus was mentioned in the Bible, just not by name. The seed of the woman, which he comes from Mary, and he comes from God, not the seed of a man. The seed of a woman will crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent is, um, of course, Satan. And it says, by Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Abel offered a lamb, and he slaughtered it and put it on an altar. Cain was a farmer, and he offered the, his produce, you know, laid it out and said, here's the work of my hands, Lord. And he knew this was the, the first little, uh, is it by Jesus' sacrifice or by our works? So Abel brought a more excellent sacrifice by bringing the slaughtered lamb to God. And Cain, which Abel, he obtained witness that he was righteous. God made him righteous by his faith in believing the promise that's going to come. Okay? God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, he still speaks. So even though Abel died a long time ago, what he did, his faith in God, still speaks to us today, right here in this verse. Verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Translated means he was raptured. He was changed. If I, I'm, my, my company is a German headquarters, so I often have to, and I don't speak German, but I've learned how to read and translate words in a certain parts and things I'm looking for, and so I have to translate from German to English. In this case, Enoch was translated from being alive in his body to a different existence just in his soul and his spirit with God. So he did not see death. By faith, Enoch was translated and was not found. So he was there and gone immediately because God translated him. Before his, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Wouldn't you like to, that to be said about you and about me? I would enjoy that, that I please God. God evidently was so pleased with Enoch that he wanted him home. And he took him to his real home. Verse 6 is a little sidebar. And then he's talking about Enoch's faith. He says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. See, by Enoch's faith, he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I like this word diligently here. We have to seek him diligently. That's like with effort constantly, continual with effort every day. Okay, Just like with my relationship with my wife, I have to choose to diligently have a good relationship with her or with my kids. It's a choice. Verse 7 says, we can get back to our roll call, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of the things not seen as yet, move, as yet moved with fear, prepared ark to the saving of his house. So the things that Noah hadn't seen, he believed God by faith. And he started getting wood together and constructing an ark when everybody else thought he was nuts. Nobody had seen this flood coming. Nobody had seen the rains that are coming. And he believed God no matter what everybody else was saying. Because look at this. By his faith, by, it says, by the which he condemned the world. Noah's faith in comparison to the people around him condemn them okay it was like night and day Noah was light and they were darkness it's an opposite our faith should see let the world see that they're condemned and that's sad but when they realize they're condemned they know they need a savior right and Noah became heir of the righteous, which is by faith. Okay? God pronounced him as righteous. 
Salvation in the Old Testament was no different than it is in the New Testament. They were pronounced as righteous by faith in Jesus, in the promises of God. Okay? That God was going to save them. We are saved by our faith in what Jesus already did in the past. It's the same. Salvation. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into place, which he into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. He was called to the promised land, but it wasn't given to him yet. Okay, He obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither, where he went. He didn't know where he was going. He just followed God. Where are we going, God? Okay. And so, Verse 9 says, By faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Tabernacles is a fancy word for tents. Abraham, his whole life, never built a stick-built home. He lived in a tent because God had him moving wherever God wanted him to go. And he took his family with him, Isaac and Jacob. That's his son and grandson. And they are heirs with him of the same promise. And this is one of my favorite verses, verse 10. For he looked, this is Abraham, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. This is very similar to what we just read in our, our key verses 13 through 16. Look at this. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The footnotes or the notes in the Bible I have here says Revelation 21. We turn it over to Revelation 21, and it says God is bringing down... He is a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, and the new earth is coming down. And, or sorry, a city is coming down from heaven to the earth. And that's the place where the roads are paved with gold, where the gates are made of pearl. And there is no sickness, no sadness, no sorrow. It's like a Peace in the Valley song. Uh, there's no, none of the things we prayed for are issues for folks. No cancer. No coronavirus, no unemployment. All of those things are gone. And that is an awesome city for us to look for. He looked for that. Abraham was not focused on putting down roots in this spot. He lived in a tent and whenever he, wherever he was going because he was looking for the city that's in Revelation 21 that we haven't seen yet. The one that has foundations. What kind of Land, you think about the foundations, Jesus is the solid rock. We were listening to music this morning on, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Right? My, my kitchen, my home, the ground that it stands on is firm as it. They build the foundations here. It will not stand. Only this city that we talk about in Revelation 21. Because whose builder and maker is God. The, the word there can be designer. The designer and creator is God. So let's go back to our key verses now to look at them in context. Verse 13. These all died in faith. All these folks we just read about. They died in faith. Not having received the promises. Okay. Uh, often we're looking for a way for our dreams to happen in this world. And God does bless us and give us wonderful things. I mean, look at my home, my family, my wife, my church. Uh, God blesses us immensely here because we're his children. But the promises that he gives us is what our focus is on. Not about what we do in this life, except to build his kingdom. Okay? Okay. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were looking, looking to the far future for the promises and were persuaded of them. They, were, they, they, were, they knew of these promises. They were persuaded. They were convinced. You couldn't talk them out of it and embraced them, right? They grabbed a hold of these promises and did not let go of them. 
and, I like all these ands, confessed. They were a witness to the people around them by their words, and words can be empty without actions, we know, and by their lives, that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. This is not their home. And this is not our home as the church. Verse 14. For they that say such things that this world's not their home, that they're looking for that city afar off, declare plainly. I can't make that any more plainly than it is. They declare plainly that they seek a country. And this word country, when you look at the original Greek word, because we just think, okay, a country. It's not like the United States or a different country. This Greek word means native country. That means where I belong, where I'm from, in a sense of my salvation. I'm now a child of God, and that world is my home. Or another way to translate would be homeland. They declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Okay, verse 15, and it says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country, now this is a different Greek world, word. It's more like the place they came from, see, from whence they came out. If they had been thinking about the world they came out of, they might have had an opportunity to have returned. This world wants to keep us. Satan wants to keep us involved in this world and, and stressed over this world and struggling with this world and wondering about everything. Am I going to have enough? If I'm, is my home big enough? Am I going to have a paycheck from my, from, from my work? And the Bible says that God will take care of those things. He's the one who feeds us. He's the one who clothes us. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will add all these things to us. Just like my kids that are here, they don't have to worry about what they're eating and what they're wearing. We go, we provide that for them. And he's a much better father than I am. We don't need to worry about these things. If they had been thinking of that country from when they came out, they might have had an opportunity to return. Luke 9.62, Jesus says, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for my kingdom. It's the same idea. When you get saved, you grab a hold of him and look forward to him, to the country that's coming, the homeland that we belong to. All right? Verse 16 says, But now they desire a better country. Do I desire a better country? Am I going to sit here and invest everything I have in trying to fix this world? I, I don't mean that we just let it go and take our hands off the wheel. We have responsibilities. But my focus, my priority, the things I I shoot for, aim for, and invest in should be in God's kingdom because this one's not going to be here one day. It's built on sinking sand. Right? The Bible tells us that. Everything here will be gone at some point and God's going to give us a new city and a new body. This one that I strive for to get my hair just right and everything else is going to be gone and I'll have a new one. It ain't going to have any of these problems. Brownies are not going to affect it anymore. And God says, it says, Wherefore, they seek a better, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. In Revelation 21. God's not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Now I want to jump down, jump over to verse 24. This is one of my favorites. This is an example of what we're talking about. We know the story of Moses, and we're going to wrap up real soon. The story of Moses. Moses led, God called Moses to lead all the Hebrews, which were the Israelites, the descendants of Jacob, who was renamed Israel, were then first put into Egypt to be saved But then they became slaves of that world with the Pharaoh thinking he's God and there's many other gods, but they only had one God. And Moses was called. Remember, he was born a Hebrew 
But his mom put him in a basket, and he was raved by the Pharaoh's daughter, and he was considered to be in the Pharaoh's family. This is the context of what we're talking about. Verse 24 says, By faith, Moses, when he came to years, come to years, that means when he got older, when he grew up, when he understood things that were happening, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now think about what he's giving up. He was a prince. He could have anything he wanted, anytime he wanted, did anything he wanted, never had to worry about what he's eating, what he's wearing, his reputation, his popularity. If people didn't like him, he'd just be done with him. Okay? He had power and riches. And he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at this. Verse 25. Choosing. He chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I'm just reading the Bible to you. I can't clarify that anymore. Moses chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for this season right now because he looked to the city that's coming. Verse 26 says, esteeming, this is awesome right here because this tells us right here that the Bible is showing us that Moses knew who Christ is. I'm not making this up. It's in this book. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. He would rather be put down like Christ. He would rather be persecuted like Jesus was of Christ. He esteemed that to be greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Let that sink in for a minute. And the last of that verse says, For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And that's a fancy King James way of saying that he understood the reward for being about Christ instead of seeking after the treasures of Egypt. Right? Verse 27 keeps going. And we're going to stop. By faith, he forsook Egypt. He turned his back on Egypt. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm not. This is not my home. I'm looking for a future home. The one with Christ. By faith, he forsook Egypt. He let it go. Not fearing the wrath of the king. Because Pharaoh was nobody. He was the most powerful king and the most powerful nation. And he thought of himself as a God, which we know he wasn't. And he was nobody. And God showed him that by the ten plagues. Because every one of his plagues was a diss on every one of their fake gods. Including Pharaoh. Pharaoh's son should have been the next God. And he died by the hand of God. God showed him that you're not a God. You don't have any power compared to God. Not fearing the wrath of the king. M Moses did not fear the wrath of the king. We shouldn't be afraid of what's going to happen around us. Right? I don't want to get political. I'm not going to get political. We don't know what's going to happen. We didn't know what's going to happen in the last few years. We don't know. But we're not going to fear the wrath of people here says, for he endured, Moses endured, he pushed through as seeing him who is invisible. Moses saw, he kept his eye on God, he kept his eye on Christ, the one who is invisible, who we can't see, but he saw him with his faith. A couple more verses we're going to look at. Because these are all, except for Hebrews, we've got Old Testament examples. But the New Testament says in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, and Garrett's going to put it up on the screen. Just clear it out. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 says that we are fellow citizens with the saints. Saints is a fancy word. In Catholic, uh, uh, they think that certain people are named as saints because they achieve certain things. Every one of us who are of been born again are saints. Every one of us who are God's church are saints. This is 
context what we're talking about. We don't like that idea because that doesn't fit the tradition of how people name saints. But the Bible, if you study it, we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's what this book is written by, prophets and apostles. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone of what's being built. So we are fellow citizens of God's household. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. That's as clear as it can be. We're not citizens of the United States. Or if you're from another country and you're, you're part of the church, you're one of God's children, I'm a citizen of heaven. And from it we await a Savior. From my citizenship, I am awaiting a Savior. Not to be saved, but for Him to call me home. For Him to come back and take me home. The Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, 16 says, They, and this is Jesus' words, says, they are, they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. In this context, Jesus is praying. And, and if you've heard of this band called We Are They, this is what they're referring to. I am they. I'm one of the they. They are not of the world. Jesus is talking about his disciples. Just as I am not of the world. One more verse. Verse Peter 2.11. Peter wrote this. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents, we're only here temporarily, to abstain from fleshly desires that war against, war against you. My fleshly desires war against who I should be for God's kingdom. Abstain from them. One of the uh, commentators on this verse I read, it said, he rephrased this verse, it said, friends... This world is not your home. Do not get cozy in it. I want to end with a, an illustration. <clears throat> and uh, I want you to imagine Pastor Brian came to you, came to us as a church. And he came to us individually or collectively, it doesn't matter. He came to us and he said, listen, I have come into this enormous amount of money. It's pretty much endless. And here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to build you a mansion. I'm going to build you a home, and it's going to be like nothing you can imagine. But I have come into enough money to do this. I'm going to build you a home, and that home, you don't have to worry about maintenance on it. It's going to be taken care of. Nothing's going to, you're going to have no problems with it. Everything's going to be just perfect. Perfect home, unimaginable. But here's the catch. It's not ready yet. You've got to wait a few months or so before it's ready. But for now, I'm going to give you this place to live, and it's an apartment. It's just, just enough, right? It's just enough. It's kind of plain. The walls are white. They just primered them. You know, it's plain Jane. It's got the basic dishwasher. It may not even have a dishwasher, Okay but you're going to stay in this apartment and in the future, in the near future, because we won't be here long, your mansion will be ready for you to move in. But oftentimes what we do is we get to looking around at what's around us and we feel like, I need to paint this thing. I need to add, upgrade the dishwasher. I need to buy new light fixtures. I need to do all this stuff to appease how I feel right now. God says we should invest in that mansion is to come. And I pray today that, that all of us, including me, as we look around at the world, I, I, I really feel like that God is allowing the world, us to see that this world is not our home. That, that we should be uncomfortable here because this is not our home. Like I am in a hotel room. There's a point when I've worn that sucker out and I'm ready to come home. I'm done with it. And it's the same. Don't get comfortable here. Let us all not get comfortable here. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. I pray that 
the words that I spoke did you justice, and I pray that, that we all here focus, think about, and the promises that are coming from afar, the promises of our home that's coming, that's not here yet, and that you use us in this world to build your kingdom, to go out and speak to people, to get to know people, to love our, our neighbors, to to build your kingdom and not fret and not worry about what's happening around us because our eyes are focused on you as the many folks in this chapter about faith. Let us have faith like these men. Let us have faith that, that you give us trust in you and your wonderful word and all the promises in it. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you for joining me this morning. Sorry it went a little long, but uh, I'm glad you joined us, me and my family, in our virtual home here. This is our a picture of our kitchen, and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday night. Join Pastor Brian and I here Wednesday night as we have our prayer time together. And then again, Pastor Brian will be here next Sunday. In the meantime, we love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you again. Bye.